Hey 2020, I haven't done a book video for quite a while, so I thought that what I could do is summarise all of these books here, the, everything that I read in the reading challenge on Goodreads last year. I'm going to rank every book that I read from the one that I enjoyed, I didn't hate it, but I didn't enjoy it very much, all the way up to my number one read, which was fantastic. If you'd like to keep on top of what I'm reading more regularly, then I'd recommend following me on Goodreads. There'll be a link down there in the description to my profile. Also in the description is a link to every book that I talk about to the Amazon page of those books. If you would like to buy one, then you can use those links, though I would encourage you to support your local bookshops, especially if it's an independent bookshop. Frankly, Jeff Bezos doesn't need the money, but if you do choose to buy something through those Amazon links, then I do get a percentage. It's not very much. But I get something, so if you want to support me, you can do that. Starting off at the bottom of the pile, unfortunately, The Hidden Life of Trees. This is a book that I've heard a great deal about. Loads of people uh, recommended it to me. I really didn't like it. I should say that the subject matter of this book is interesting. Trees are fascinating to me. I have long loved forests. Hanging around near trees is kind of like a very calming thing to do for me. But I did not like the way this book was written. It, uh, it comes in these sort of pithy bite-sized chunks, uh, which are literally like five pages long in some cases. Uh, it's like reading a book of tweets. It does hang together, but it's... Like, that's not a chapter. I can't take a, a discretized reading experience from that, all right? It's not enough. I found it way too stop-starty. I just... <sighs> Interesting stuff, but told in the wrong way for me. Next up, something that's a bit more of home territory for me, Lucky Planet by uh, David Waltham. This is a book basically about the anthropic principle. In a nutshell, that's what this book is about. It's about how um, perhaps we are here able to comprehend the universe because actually the Earth is really quite remarkable in that we are very lucky to live on Earth. The conditions here are just right for life. We shouldn't think that there are lots of planets out there which are habitable. And you know, the book makes a good case. Perhaps I know too much about this subject anyway. I basically read it, um, I think this was a present actually, um, so I uh, was obviously going to read it, uh, I thought we'd be rude not to, um, and it is interesting. I found the author a little bit too jokey and annoying if I'm completely honest with you. God, I've, I've got a lot of books to get through, I'm gonna have to do like really rapid reviews. Basically, if you find that idea interesting then you should give this a read, especially if you're interested in sort of deep history of Earth, looking back hundreds of millions and billions of years. It's a good introduction, but again, not really for me. Next, something completely different, May We Borrow Your Language by Philip Gooden. This is a book about etymology, and a little bit like The Hidden Life of Trees, it suffers from the same problem of being very stop-starty, so it's not like a narrative of how, narr of how um, language evolves, it's about how individual words have evolved. So gorsh, for example, uh, oh gorsh, oh I'm gonna have to edit that out. The chapter is literally that many pages, and then we're on to serendipity, and then we're on to kayak sandwich and the um the thread that goes through the book is the age of the word so the oldest word in here is wheel wheel Yeah, that's not a word in modern English. <laughs> I, I thought I was, I was having a stroke for a second then. <laughs> Signifies a Celt, basically. Uh, its plural form is the basis of Wales and Welsh. It's uh, from 60, sorry, 690. Um, the 8th century is the first recognisable word, which is thing. I'm an etymology nerd. I really like etymology. Um, and so I picked this up, uh, literally complete impulse buy. And it is interesting. Again, it suffers from the same problem, um, it being very stop-starty. But I found the individual chapters more interesting. This is, a, you know, it's a good book. Uh, there is the Etymologicon, which my mum has recommended to me, and I think a few other people on this channel have, which I think is a more of a kind of overview, which is what I'm more interested in when it comes to etymology, like big ideas, how words change over time. And I mean, this is obviously talking a lot about how English has borrowed words from Anglo-Saxon, German, French, Old French, Latin, Hindi, all over the world. That stuff's interesting. Again, I feel like I keep complaining about the format. Again, the format just annoyed me a little bit with this book, but it's an interesting read. Next, a book which I don't actually have because I think I lent it to my mum, If Walls Could Talk by Lucy Worsley. Um, this is billed as a history of the home. Uh, and it is, but it's specifically a history of the English home. And it looks at the bathroom, the bedroom, the living room, and the kitchen. And it's an interesting domestic history. Uh, it's a little bit of like frothy 
history, if that's the right word to use. Um, it's a little bit um, introductory, which, you know, is the purpose of the book. It's not an academic book at the end of the day. I found it a little bit narrow focused on just the UK um, and England really it doesn't even really go beyond the English borders um, I would have enjoyed something that was a bit more global it was nice and chatty in its style but I would have preferred it to be a little bit more in depth I guess um, if you're interested in domestic history though um, and how we arrived at for example having a kitchen in the house as opposed to in a separate uh, you know building how we arrived at you know something obvious like a flushing toilet but also something like toilet paper um, it, it, was, it was an interesting read, actually. I would recommend it. Next up, and probably controversially low down, Homo Deus by Yuval Noah Harari. Several of these books in this list I have reviewed elsewhere. I, I review everything on my Goodreads that I read, um, but I did a whole video on this, so I refer you to that. Basically, it's no Sapiens, but it's pretty interesting. Check out the link in the description for the video on this one if you want to learn more of my thoughts. Coming to the midpoint of the list, next up is The Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars by Michael Mann. Um, this is... Good. I, yeah, we, this is the tipping point of the list where I'm stopping, stop having so many problems with uh, the format of the book and I can look past those faults and just really enjoyed it. The hockey stick refers to a graph in uh, climate science which is basically uh, showing that Earth's temperature had been relatively stable for a long time and then anthropogenic climate change kicks in and it shoots up at the end like a a hockey stick. Michael Mann is one of the key scientists associated with it. He kind of came up with the uh, the original version of it. There have been several since. Um, and the book is partly about the, the climate science behind it, but it's also about the uh, attacks made on it and on Michael Mann since. Uh, he has become a lightning rod for climate skeptics, um, people who deny anthropogenic climate change and also as a consequence people on the right wing establishment, uh, right, sorry, in the right wing establishment in America. And the book is partly about his personal experience and I think um, that personal aspect is going to be more interesting to some people than to others. I think I would have preferred a bit more of an, a broad overview, perhaps something a bit more like Merchants of Doubt. Um, but you know, if you're interested in the human side of climate change um, as well as the, the actual science this is an excellent primer for the actual science and for the individuals that you know did the science what is kind of interesting is that it is written uh, to be legally watertight like he um, talks about a programming trick in uh, when he was a kid he, he was learning how to program um, and he basically found a shortcut like a little trick and he had to explain in minute detail what that meant when he used the phrase a programming trick um, because it's the kind of thing that people would read you know uh, a, a, a trick in the mathematical analysis when you're looking at something like a temperature data set. Um, some people would say like, wait a minute, that means you're fudging the data. So it's kind of funny that you, you can see that he, he's, his brain is working to make everything he says as watertight as possible. Just kind of sad, really, that it's necessary, but an interesting personal story. Right, okay, I'm cheating a little bit here. I'm lumping a whole series of books together because I read 25 books last year and a lot of them was this series. Uh, there are God, how many books even are in the series? There are 15 books in this series, uh, which is Gaunt's Ghosts. The first one came out in the mid 90s and the last one, Anarch, here at the bottom, got it, heavy. Anarch came out this year. Um, and basically this was kind of like my young adult Harry Potter. It's a series that I have read every book of. I know all the characters by heart. I have reread several of them several times. Uh, and in anticipation for the final book coming out, I reread the whole series. So starting, uh, oh, they're actually completely out of order, but starting with the founding first and only, and then working my way through down to Anarch was a, a really interesting experience. I reviewed all of them on my Goodreads. Um, oh, they're about Warhammer, by the way. Probably should have said that sooner. Basically, it's a series set in the Warhammer 40,000 universe about an Imperial Guard regiment, which is a series of humans um, fighting other humans and occasionally aliens. Uh, Xenos, sorry. And it's a format that is basically the Sharp series, but instead of being Napoleonic combat, it is combat in the 41st millennium. Incredibly dorky. Um, I'm not going to say that it is stellar writing. Dan Abner, who is the author, is a New York Times bestseller. He also um, co-wrote Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, and, you know, he's gone on to do things way beyond Warhammer, but this is his single largest opus, I think. And while it's not Ulysses, it is very fun to read. It's crunchy. The books basically all suffer from the same drawbacks, um, uh, you know, the same problems. The books which are best in the series, which, for the record, are... First and only, Necropolis, 
Sabat Mata, Traitor General, and Blood Pact. Blood Pact might actually be my favourite controversial. The best books are the ones which uh, overcome those difficulties um, and in particular have, for example, good antagonists, they have good character development. As a whole, as a series, I'm not going to recommend it to absolutely everybody, but um, if you would like to read A Small Tree and uh, you like military sci-fi, if you like sci-fi action, then it's a hard recommend from me. <laughs> the entire Gaunt Ghost series, however, is pipped by Brothers of the Snake, also by Dan Abnett, um, which again, I have uh, reviewed in a previous video. Basically, if you're interested in Warhammer, if you've heard me talk about it, this is probably the single best individual book that you could read to get into it. And also, it's a sapling, not a redwood. So, smaller time investment. It's a gateway drug. Be very careful with your wallet. Then coming in at number three, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca Sklute. This book is great. It's an all-time, um, you know, everybody seems to recommend it for people that are interested in doing medicine, for example, because it has a lot to say about medical ethics. Basically, Henrietta Lacks was an individual. She was more than an individual. She was a black woman in the south of America who uh, unfortunately died at a relatively young age, but her cells were kept in a lab and uh, basically found to be immortal. So, hence the title. Um, they kept dividing and dividing and they are still in existence all over the world. They're called Hella cells. Henrietta Lacks. The problem is that these cells were taken and cultivated without her family's knowledge and so her family had no idea that um, her cells were being used all over the world in medical research and the book is basically an interesting blending of storylines looking at the science of um, her cells being used but also the story of her family and story of Henrietta herself because it's a rather tragic story it's really quite sad but also what's sad is the story of her family finding out about these cells how they're being used it's kind of got a bit of everything. It's it's a beautifully written book. It's um, it's fascinating to read the science and the human story. Um, it, you know, I can scarcely think of anybody that wouldn't find this interesting. It, it's one of my favourite books that I've read in the past couple of years. In at number two, and with a lot of the same arguments for it. The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat by Oliver Sacks. Another book which everybody seems to recommend, especially if you're doing medicine. I actually have a friend who um, is specialising in psychology. Um, we went to Oxford together, he did medicine and I did physics. And um, I asked him if he'd read this and he was like, yeah, I wrote a personal statement to apply for medicine. <laughs> yes, I read it. For those of you that don't know, Oliver Sacks is a uh, doctor, a, a, a late Oliver Sacks actually, he died not too long ago, basically looking at neurological disorders. That was his specialty. And this book is a, a kind of a series of case studies looking at individual patients who had different disorders. I don't think there's a single repeated disorder in the book. I might be wrong. The thing about it is that unlike The Hidden Life of Trees, for example, the individual chapters are, you get a good amount of depth, a good amount of interest. I think some of them are very short but for the most part they're long enough to be sort of fully formed short stories almost. Um, you really connect with these people and you connect with Oliver Sacks. You get a real sense of the author in this. That's partly because of the experiences, his experiences which he's put into the book but also how beautiful his prose is. The way that he writes this book is just beautiful. It's, it's basically poetry. Um, it may well be the most beautifully written piece of non-fiction I think I've read. A bit like Henrietta Lacks, you've got the science angle to it, you've got the human angle, there's also a lot of comedy in this. Some, sometimes intentional, sometimes unintentional, you know, the half of the patient. It, it's a fantastic book. It's one of those books which can potentially change your life and um, yeah. In case you can't tell, I'd recommend it. <laughs> and then coming in at number one for 2019, Silk Roads by Peter Frankopan. I have to admit, choosing between these top three was very difficult. The Silk Roads, I think, edged it because it had a similar effect to me or on me that uh, Sapiens by uh, Yuvanoa Harari did. It is a broad, sweeping look at history and it kind of fundamentally changes the way that you look at the world. Sapiens changes the way that you look at power structures, the way the world is organised. The Silk Roads makes you really look at a world map and it makes you really look at how um, overstated the role of certainly Western Europe is in global history and how we are presented with a really quite a skewed uh, representation 
of history. What's interesting is that the book accelerates. So no, I mean the opposite, I mean decelerates, uh, in that it covers large chunks of time per page at the beginning, and then gradually it gets more and more zoomed in. As we get close to the present, it dedicates more and more time to the events. Because this book starts with the very earliest civilizations, uh, the very beginnings of agriculture in the Middle East, um, and the connections that were starting to form between Africa and Europe and China along the titular Silk Roads, that road that at one point transported silks from China to the West. And it starts, as I say, the very earliest of civilizations, and it finishes post 9-11. Uh, it finishes right up to the present day, and in fact he has released a new one, which is sat over there, <laughs> the new Silk Roads, um, which I'm going to be reading this year, and I've got very high hopes for. Uh, and what, by doing this, it really puts everything that you know about the Middle East and you think about the history of consonants relating to each other, the history of um, the Occident and the Orient, you know, whether one was dominant over the other or not, in a completely different perspective. And also how effectively it's the same relation over and over again, but the commodity might change. At one point it's not silk that's going along the roads, it's oil. At another point in history it's slaves, at another point it's fur. Um, you know, it shows how much has changed and how much has not. Like Sapiens, I, uh, I found it to be a really exhilarating read. It, you know, really... Trumping up my words trying to think of how much I like it. <laughs> like the best non-fiction, it basically made me realise a new way of looking at the world, and it made me realise a new way of writing non-fiction, um, in that this is written in a similar manner to a textbook, but in a way that is incredibly accessible. I think Peter Frankopan has done something amazing with the text of this, in the same way that Oliver Sacks did with The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. It gives you a new reference point. So, you know, in life we're all prisoners of our previous reference points. You only think something is good by comparing it to something that you thought before was good. This and Oliver Sacks and Henrietta Lacks this year set a new standard for non-fiction for me, which is I'm sure going to mean that I'm disappointed by more books in future, but it has shown me how high the ceiling can be. I look forward to it being broken this year, but my word, these top three books in particular, and perhaps most of all Silk Roads, they've really set the bar high. So excluding Gaunt's Ghost because I physically can't hold all of the books, these were my kind of books of the year in in order. As I say, I've put links down in the description to all of these. If you have read these and perhaps have a different set of thoughts on them than I have had, then do let me know in the comments. And I'm going to regret saying this, if you have any recommendations uh, for what I should read this year, perhaps what your top book of last year was, pop that in the uh, comments as well, because I'm always really interested to read the comments on these books videos. That just leaves me to say thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. You can give the video a like and a share if you enjoyed it i guess that's how youtube works right and uh yeah that basically just leaves me to say i will see you in the next one thanks for watching